and the men and women who write them. This podcast is brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, home of the best-selling authors in the Western genre. This is your host, Ginger Winters. Thank you for joining us as we read Honored Friend and Hero, written by Jeff Crawford, read by Cameron Buckner. Six. He cut notches into a finger-sized limb each morning after he had awakened. Each morning he cut a new notch so that he would have a record of the passing days. On the wall where he had chipped away the coal to obtain his fuel for the fire, he had simply by accident created a shelf. It was on this shelf that he kept his marker of days in this place. When each limb had 30 notches, it was relegated to a different shelf and a new limb was brought in. There were 13 pieces of limbs on the shelf now. There were 13 notches on the newest limb. For almost 14 months now, this coal shaft had been his home. In the time that had passed, he taught himself many things, not things that should be held up as shining examples of how a thing was to be done, but still he was proud of himself for having accomplished them. He had fashioned a small bed of sorts from straight and arm-sized tree branches and vines that he had woven green and allowed to dry in place. Once done, it had made an acceptable version of a bed. Since eating small game was something that he did almost every day, he had learned to tan hides and to make rawhide strips. With these two things, he made blankets and a semblance of a mattress. He had taught himself to fashion pots from clay and to carve bowls, cups, and forks so he didn't feel so much like an animal as he ate each night. He had made a chair to sit in by the fire and another to sit in a vantage point so that he could watch the pool to see what he would be having for his supper that night. It wasn't sadistic watching them come and become ensnared. It passed the time and served as entertainment. He learned to cut his own hair with his knife, his beard also, although he had not gone so far as to try shaving with the blade yet. He had learned to wear as little as possible during the warmer weather so that his clothing might last just a little longer. He had learned that there was a road a little more than a mile away from where he now lived. It wasn't a heavily trafficked road, but sometimes if he sat there all day, he saw a horse or a horse-drawn cart carrying a person or people from a place to another different place. These sightings always filled him with fear, but he watched all the same because it was as close as he was ever going to get to human company. He had learned that it was important to talk out loud to himself, more important than he'd originally believed it to be. One day it dawned on him that he had gone weeks without hearing a word, and closer examination of that showed him the darkness that he was sliding into. He realized that it was important that when he had a thought or a problem, that it be talked through just so he could hear the words and picture the images created more clearly in his mind. He was careful not to converse with himself because he feared that that would lead him down a path that he might never find his way back from. But hearing the words and the tone and timbre that he had imagined them inside his head was important. He believed that it would keep him connected with his humanity, not to mention his sanity. And he wondered on occasion if worrying about maintaining your sanity was an indicator that you still possessed it. He also wondered if he was already gone and the questions that he asked himself were just coverings to keep his mind from knowing the truth. He'd had an uncle who had gone all peculiar and had to be put away from people and family. He did not want to go through what he had watched his uncle go through, even though he himself had no one around him to embarrass or make feel ill at ease owing to the current conditions. It was dreadful watching someone lose their mind and he would avoid it if it was at all possible. But on the sunnier side... 
If his mind did slip its traces, it was quite possible and even likely that he would never know it. He had also learned that unless the snake is on your chest and staring into your eyes with its own, it is better not to panic because that can lead to a disastrous result. He learned this particular lesson the hard way. It had been toward the tail end of summer when the nights had begun to cool, but the days remained warm. He had thrown a little more coal on the fire than usual and was settled in under his blanket of fur. It was one of those nights that were neither too warm nor too chilled. Sleep, when it came, would be a comfortable one. Strange images danced on the black shining walls, images created by the always changing flames of the fire. He was watching these images evolve and dissolve, and sometimes he would see ships with tall masts upon the waves, and sometimes he would see a line of cannons. And once he saw Starry brushing her hair from her eyes with her fingertips, and once he saw a snake slither its way toward his bed, which sat only a few inches above the dirt. He had been almost asleep, that point in which you aren't entirely sure if what you're seeing is real or a dream. Dream or not, it disturbed him, and he focused. He had witnessed men being destroyed in the most heinous of ways, but snakes bothered him. Truly, that isn't to say that the damage wrought upon the bodies of those men that he had seen die in battle hadn't had a terrible and profound effect on him because it had. Enough so that he had fled and in the process, he had given up everything he had ever known or would ever know. But snakes really bothered him. The urge to flee so that he could escape the danger or even the possibility of danger hadn't been as the desire to flee from the battlefield had been, that one he had thought long and hard about. He had deliberated and considered what might happen if he ran compared to what might happen if he stayed. For days he had wrestled with the decision of whether to stay or whether to go. But with the snake incident, he had run without giving it a second thought. All he knew was that he wanted to be as far the hell away from the snake as he could be and as quickly as was humanly possible. It was the not thinking things through entirely as he usually did that was his downfall. Once he had convinced himself that the snake that he was seeing was in fact real and not an image conjured up by his imagination in a dream state, or a particularly vivid shadow created by the flames of the fire, he did what he almost never did. He panicked. It was nearly as big around as his arm. For more than a year, he had subsisted on nearly nothing, so his arm wasn't as large as it once was. Still, a snake as big around as your arm was something to take special notice of. It was long, and he could tell that because it nearly circled his entire fire ring with its body. On this night that was cooler than the nights had been for months, the snake had been as happy to find a place where it could warm its body as Reuben had been when he had found the coal shaft originally. The understanding of how the snake felt about the fire being similar to how he had felt about the coal shaft never entered his mind. When it came to snakes, Reuben did not believe in the being his brother's keeper notion. He wanted two things in that moment. He wanted to have distance between himself and the snake, and then he wanted the thing dead. With violence, he flung his blanket of mixed and mingled furs toward the wall and thrust himself upward until he was standing on a small bed that he had been lying in just moments earlier. With effort, he forced himself to breathe more regularly. He stood atop the bed barefooted in just the lower half of his long underwear, and he watched the snake lying motionless, as if it now owned the coal shaft and also the fire. Every minute or two, the snake would flex or contract, and like ripples on a pond, the motion begun in the center of the snake's body would echo until it finally reached its triangular head, or the nib of its tail. Reuben's stomach rolled each time he saw the snake do this. There was no accounting for the root cause of his fear of any and all serpents. He knew because he had wondered about it at length. 
He had simply been born with an ingrained dread of them. He watched as the snake pretended to doze. It was obvious now that it had found a dry and warm place that probably did want to just lie there and sleep for a time. But it was a snake, so it knew there was a man there also. It would not sleep so long as there was a potential threat existing. It laid almost motionless, aside from the periodic slight writhing and the almost imperceptibly slight opening of its eyes. Always it wanted to know where the man was. Reuben neither knew nor cared if the snake was of a venomous variety. Knowing that it might just bite him but not fill his bloodstream with poison made no difference to him. Just the thought of the vile thing coming in contact with his flesh nearly caused his bowels to loosen. He took his eyes from the snake momentarily so he might do a quick inventory of his meager possessions and find something, anything, that could be used to destroy the thing. The heavy rifle barrel stood leaning against the wall but on the far side of the room. If it wanted to, the snake could be there and have at him before he could close his fingers around it. The best option was his knife, but using it came with difficulties as well. For one thing, it was stuck in the arm of the ramshackle chair he had built for sitting by the fire while he ate or thought or tried to keen the edge of the knife blade on the smooth stone he'd found in the pool. The other thing was that to use the knife, he would have to get uncomfortably close to the snake. Everything inside told him to get as far away from it as possible, but to get rid of it for good, he would need to get nearer than he had ever been to a snake, and he honestly didn't know if he had it within himself to do it. Voluntarily, walking up to the snake was against everything that he was made of. He looked to see if there happened to be a sizable chunk of coal lying nearer to hand that he might retrieve and throw at the snake. With a bit of luck, this throw might be accurate enough and forceful enough to splatter the brains of the serpent all over the dirt floor, but there were no pieces of coal anywhere to be had aside from those pieces that he kept piled neatly in the area that he had designated for the coal storage. He eyed the knife again and began to calculate in his head the distance he would need to leap so that he could put a hand on the knife without having to put a bare foot on the ground anywhere near the snake's head. Thunder pounded in his ears as he balanced on the outside rail of his bed. His heels touched nothing. All of his weight was on the balls of his feet and his toes were wrapped over the edge of the rail so they might push also and perhaps gain him a few more inches when he left. It turned out that they did more harm than good. Curling and straightening his toes as they sought purchase, he wasn't even aware that he was doing it. His mind was on what to do with the knife once it was in his hand and his focus and attention was solely on the knife itself, just a few feet away, stuck down into the arm of the chair. He didn't count to three in his head. He was afraid he would keep coming up with a reason to halt the count. He simply bent his knees and propelled himself through the air. Had he paid just a bit of attention to how the bed actually felt to his feet, Reuben likely would have felt the loop of vine that the big toe of his right foot had wandered into. He never felt it until it pulled tight, but by then it was too late. Whatever distance he might have covered with his heroic leap was cut considerably shorter when the vine refused to stretch any farther. Snatched less than gracefully out of midair and thrown unceremoniously to the ground, Screams filled the coal shaft. Some were for the toe that hurt like nothing before ever had, and some were from his seeing the snake slither around to face him and then raise its head several inches off the ground to sway back and forth as it stared at Reuben from only a couple of feet away. Despite the pain, he rapidly crawled backwards until he felt the bed against his back. He pulled at the vine to tear it loose from his foot. The uncontrollable screaming started again and the snake stopped swaying. It only stared now. His toe was bent at an unnatural angle. Instead of sticking more or less straight out, 
it now pointed down for the most part. Gingerly, he eased the vine from around it and began to wonder what he was supposed to do now. An agitated snake was between his crippled body and his knife. Possibly, if he was in fine fashion as he had been five minutes earlier, maybe he could have leapt over the snake from the bed, but that was no longer even an option. It was out of joint and likely broken. Even if he could bear the pain of walking, he couldn't take a step as long as it sat as it did. He would have been walking on top of his toe and would either break it worse or trip and fall if he tried. The snake actually retreated when Reuben started screaming the second time since making it back to the bed. Without thinking for fear of losing his nerve, he crossed his legs, grabbed the toe, and pulled with all his might until he felt the bones align. When he finally let go, the relief was not complete, but it was substantial. He was going to cry. He just knew that he would, and he was right. To the right was the longer way around to the chair, but it was opposite of the snake's head. He hobbled as fast as he could manage and picked up the rifle barrel as he went by to use as a cane. His intent was to collect his knife, but he realized that now he had the heavy barrel, and that increased his reach by nearly three feet. Temporarily disassociating himself from the agony, he charged at the snake, swinging the cylinder of steel with each step. He felt the blows connecting with the snake's head and body, but he didn't care that it was likely already dead or helplessly crippled. He kept swinging until he was exhausted. He wanted to lie down and not move at all for weeks, but he needed to address his foot, and he wanted the snake out of his home. He slid his uninjured foot into a boot and scooped the snake up with the end of the rifle barrel. Carefully, he made his way up the incline to a clear and cooling night. He was gritting his teeth with each step. Once outside, he flung the snake with the use of the barrel as far into the darkness as possible. Then he hobbled all the way to his water pool so he could soak his foot in the cool water. He sat there all night long with one foot in the water while he wished that he had reminded himself to pick up the knife before leaving. This had been the first. It never occurred to him to wonder what he might do if a medical situation arose, or if it had, he hadn't spent a lot of time pondering it. What would he do next time because there was sure to be a next time? The next need might originate from inside his body instead of being caused by an oversight. This had been an accident, and it could have been avoided, but that's what happens. When you aren't paying attention, that's when the accidents come and get you. He would eventually heal from this setback. He wasn't worried about that. What had him concerned was the next time. What if the next incident was more serious or even grave? What would he do then, living all to himself in the manner that he was? He despised the notion of spending his days and nights worrying about the sword of Damocles hanging over his head, suspended by only cobwebs, but he now knew that becoming comfortable and complacent could and probably would be his undoing. He now knew that hanging a toe in a loop of old vine was as large a threat, if not larger, than his constant fear that his mind would unravel, and both were greater concerns to him now than what could have happened on the battlefield ever was. 7. Reuben stared at the holes in the knees of his pants. Mind absent, his fingers traced the edges of the tear to the shirt's fabric around his elbow. He knew that with care he could get a few more months wear out of each, but he didn't want to keep wearing them. He might be living like an animal, but it was the rags that he covered his body with that made him feel like one. It had been two years since he had ventured down there. It had been hard then, and this time would be harder. Shuffling to the pool for his water and to collect the meat from his snares was bad enough, especially on those cold, wet days. The toe he had set never had healed properly and it pained him to walk, particularly on uneven ground that seemed to make up everything around there. 
to go down there, where there were farmsteads would take two, if not three days of walking to go and get back. Each step would be painful, and he had to decide if all of it was worth it just to steal a shirt or two and a pair of breeches. One day, so long ago now it seemed, the cabin fever had really taken a hold, and he just had to get out and look around. It had been more than three years since he had begun living in the coal shaft, and it was beginning to feel as if the walls were closing in on him. Where he wanted to go, Reuben hadn't known. He just wanted to see something anything new. He walked with the lamp until he spotted the road. He kept to the top of the ridge so that he was near undetectable behind all the laurels and hemlocks, but could still see the road. Even after all this time, he had no idea where the road went, but it went somewhere, and that was all that mattered at the moment. He had a little basket that he had woven from oak splits that was full of roasted rabbit and muskrat, and a canteen full of water, so he felt comfortable with being gone a while. He had made sure to cover the entrance to the coal shaft convincingly, just in case someone happened to stumble into it as he had. The only thing scarier to him than venturing out was returning to find that he no longer had a place to live because it had been discovered. The crowing of a rooster was a sound that growing up he had been used to, but when it happened to start crowing as he slipped around through the tree line that ringed the small farm, it was all he could do not to turn and run. Sounds associated with domesticated living were now so foreign to him that they had become frightening to Reuben. He steeled himself and made himself remember that the sounds that were scaring him were the same sounds that everyone living there were used to and quite comfortable with. His intent, once he had spotted the farmstead, was to find a place where he could sit in near invisibility and simply watch. The need to just see people had begun to overwhelm him once he had actually found a place where people lived. He had no desire to talk to them. In fact, he had a strong desire not to. But he did want to watch them go about their daily lives. He had felt for a while that he was losing his connection with humanity and it was his hope that this might restore a little of it so he tucked himself into the growth of underbrush that had sprouted on some high ground. He twisted and squirmed until he was comfortable, and then he waited. The man came out of the house first. He had a bucket in his hand. The sun was near to setting, and for the past while Reuben had listened to the lone cow bellowing in the small barn. She was signaling that she needed milking. Anyone whose chore it had been to do the milking knew that familiar bellow, himself included. His mouth began to water as he remembered how good a cool glass of buttermilk had always tasted. Well, the man walked across the span between the house and the small barn, and he was smoking a pipe, and it reminded Reuben of his father. The woman followed soon after with a mixing bowl wedged between the crook of her elbow and her ribs, and Reuben knew what she was about to do before she started. His mother had done the same thing in the same way every day. The woman began scattering bits and bobs from her kitchen cooking and from the scraping of supper plates around the yard. And the chickens, who were more hers than they were her husband's, all came running to eat what she had thrown out for them. They gathered around her ankles and began pecking at the ground for biscuit crumbs or specks of tomatoes. These people were doing well as far as he could tell. That was an ambitious thought to place confidence in, seeing as he had only sat watching them for a little more than an hour. But Reuben knew what life on a family farmstead was like, and what he was seeing was better than what his family had managed with. There were no displays of opulence or showy signs of abundant wealth, but neither were there scars of the war having ravaged them. These people looked to be well-fed and were wearing clean clothes that bore no patches that he could see. And some would have noticed these things and would have decided that the rewards for their hard work and good fortune should be shared. Reuben did not believe such, but the clean clothes on the drying line pulled at him. It came down to the fact that they had and he had not. Life for these two people would go on tomorrow much like all their lives had gone on, even if a pair of breeches and a shirt or two turned up missing in the morning. 
but something more than mere rags might make quite a bit of difference to Reuben. He waited until they had grown quiet on the front porch where they had watched the setting sun, and he waited until the man had stretched his strong arms and yawned. He waited while he watched their silhouettes move from the front room into one of the ones farther back in the house, and he waited until the last light in the home had been put out. And then he waited some more, and as he chewed on a piece of cold muskrat, he told himself that he was just being curious. What he would not debate with himself was the struggle he was having with stealing from these people. In all likelihood, if he were to go up on the porch and rap on their doorpost, they would probably gift him with clothes to wear and perhaps even some food to carry with him as he went on his way. But that was an option available to other beggars and vagabonds, and it was not an option that he had. These folks might be clever with their inquiries, and he had been so long put away from people he had no confidence in his ability to answer just as cleverly. And quiet like a mist, he stole into their yard and took one pair of pants and two shirts. On his way back to the tree line, he paused in a shadow and stared at the barn. It was certainty he knew that there were things inside of the building that would serve him well. Tools and implements that he could use and greatly desired. But they were not breeches and shirts. The man might have to make his remaining clothing last a couple of months longer than he had intended But that wouldn't harm him or take food from him and his wife's table. Taking the tools that he used daily to survive just might. Reuben clutched his stolen garments a little tighter as he ran for the cover of the shadows. He traveled all through the night, and he still felt comfortable moving that way. But all the while that he was walking, he kept his senses stretched for sounds of conversation or of a wagon wheel turning. The sparsely used road was not so far away that he would not hear it if it were being traveled, and his eyes flicked this way and that, looking for lights in the darkness created by cooking or sentinel fires. And he made sure to know where the breezes came from so that he could sniff it periodically for a hint of smoke. Maybe he wouldn't hear voices or wheels turning. Maybe he wouldn't see the small but bright orange flames poking out of the dark but he was sure that if smoke were on the breeze, he would detect it. Surely, if a brigade or troop or unit was nearby, he would hear or see something to alert him, but he couldn't take any chances with anything. It hadn't been easy since he had run from his obligation, but it had been successful, and it was all because he had been cautious in all things. So far as he knew, the war was still being waged in earnest and possibly not so far from where he now walked. Acting as if everything was over and done with was the surest way he knew to be noticed, and being noticed was the last thing he would allow. Even if the war wasn't being fought on a front not so far away, those who worked in the shadows could be anywhere. Not finding those that they searched for was carried like a personal insult might be. It was a mark on their abilities and a slight to their attentiveness. Forever, those that hunted for him would continue to look in dim corners and down bleak alleys. The war would undoubtedly end one day, but those hounds would never give up the hunt. It had been late in the summer of 62 when he had taken his leave of the army and of the war and now two summers had come and gone already. He knew the men he had been fighting with. Even if the shot and powder ran out, they would continue to fight. They locked onto the calls the same as a hound locks its teeth onto a hog's ear. The hounds don't turn loose until they are dead, and those men who wore the gray uniforms were the same damn way. He couldn't say much about the other side because he didn't know any of them, but from what he had observed, They didn't like backing up either, and that was why he could never be less than on his guard. For some, the war would continue until the lid was nailed down and the dirt was being shoveled in. So as long as that was going on, he would never feel safe to just walk about as other men do. It had always seemed to him that the war had been a war of passions, despite what any politician or those who rode the horses instead of walking might say. 
and the passions are what keeps the thing alive. As long as the potential was there for the war to keep churning, then he would have to remain as he was. Only when every soldier from both sides was dead would he finally feel free, and the chances of him living long enough to feel that freedom ever again were not very good. Rested, he continued his walk back to the coal shaft that he called home. He felt safe there, but he now knew that he would never feel anything other than alone. It was the price to be paid for the decision he had made. 8. He cut the thirteenth notch in a limb and placed it gently on the pile with the others that had the same thirty notches. He had to do it gently so they wouldn't all tumble and clatter to the ground. There were eighty-five of them now, but each day to him seemed to last forever in his lonesome existence. But when he gave thought to it, it seemed as if it were only yesterday that he had found this place to live and hide in. It didn't seem as if he had been here seven years plus a month. Each day had dragged agonizingly slow like molasses through sand. But the years had come and gone, like the good book said, quicker than a weaver's shuttle. He wondered who was winning the war now, and he wondered if anyone was. So much of the time when he had been in the thick of it, it had seemed like a stalemate. Each side so bullheaded that they refused just to stop and go home. And the amount of killing taking place didn't seem to matter as long as one side or the other could claim a momentary victory. They were probably out there still killing each other in wholesale fashion and he had not spoken a word to another soul in more than seven years. Let them trade places with him for a time and he was sure that those guns would have gone quiet. Only when you were refused the company of your fellow man can you appreciate them, flaws and all, he thought. Wonder where they're killing each other today, he asked himself. Seven years gone by. That's a lot of time to travel and find new ground to bloody. In the seven years since he had been living in the coal shaft, very little had changed. Of course, some things were different but those were minor when looked at alongside the time that he had been here. His once dark hair was now more gray than black. He was aware of the change more every few months when he gave himself a haircut. His beard was now all gray. Two of the large mighty trees that surrounded and protected his home had fallen for reasons that he did not know. The trees had once stood tall and forceful on the incline behind the shaft where he lived. Their falling did little aside from opening up some space in the canopy for him to sit under in the sun. It wasn't until he started doing it daily, if weather permitted, that he realized how much of his life had been spent in the shadows and darkness. It felt good to sit with his head leaned back so the sun could shine on his face. And once a fox crept up and pressed against his palm with its damp nose as he sat dozing in the sun. And Reuben awoke from his sleep as soon as he felt the touch, but he didn't jerk his hand away. With one eye open, he watched the fox. They studied each other for more time before the fox grew bored and trotted away. He hoped the little fellow did not make his way into his snares, He would have hated eating the little fellow that he had enjoyed watching so much. With a little ingenuity and quite a bit of hard work, he had fashioned a garden of sorts. Not a large one like he had raised years earlier when he had still been living with his family, but a small one set out in a sporadic and periodic method. A hill here for a squash plant, a scraped off spot here for a tomato plant, cleared ground around a poplar tree so a couple of vines of green beans would have somewhere to run, and different animals, sharing the ridges with him, matched wits with him for the fruits of his labor, but he was able to eat a few vegetables each night of the season. He had taken the plants from different farmstead gardens once they had sprouted and grown to sufficient size to be relocated. He never took all the plants from the same garden plot, and that wouldn't have been fair to the farmer that was counting on them for his summer and winter fare. But a plant or two here or there seemed to be something he could live with taking. 
After years of eating almost nothing aside from roasted meat, he was amazed at how wonderful it was to bite into a tomato or crunch away on green beans right off the vine. Most of what he grew would have been all the better if they had been cooked in his mother's kitchen all day with a fist-sized chunk of side meat and served beside a large wedge of cornbread, but what he had was better than burnt muskrat any day. And the special treat was the quart of cane syrup that he had snitched from a shelf on the outside of a smokehouse. One spoonful per day was what he allowed himself as a special treat, and on rare occasions he allowed himself too. Once he had brought a jar home, he had to busy himself with carving a spoon, just so he could enjoy that special luxury. It was a grand taste at the end of each day, until the night that it wasn't. He'd always had something of a sweet tooth. His father's vice had been smoking tobacco, and his mother's had been hot tea each morning, but his had always been sweets. Starry found this secret out from Reuben's mother and tested out her baking skills on him with frequency. Not often did a week go by that he hadn't been gifted with most of a cake or the majority of a pie. Her father enjoyed the sweeter bites as well, so Reuben rarely received an intact gift. The offerings from her oven weren't the reason that Reuben fell in love with Starry, but it was one of the ways that she intended to keep him feeling that way. So when the temptation for something sweet presented itself for the first time in nearly ten years, Reuben was in no position to stiffen his back and turn aside from it. His weakness overtook him, and he didn't care. For more than a week, he ate barely tasting his food as he chewed with anticipation of that spoonful of delight that he would wallow around in his mouth to savor before grudgingly he allowed only a trace after trace to slide down his throat until his mouth was finally empty. Then, with admirable willpower, he would place the jar in a safe place and begin anticipating a repeat the next night. But on the eighth night, even though the taste was just as exquisite as it had been the previous nights, something was different and horribly wrong. There had been a stiffness or soreness or something new and odd located somewhere around the back of his right jaw as he worked his way through a roasted rabbit and some lettuce. He gave it little thought. He assumed he had turned his head the wrong way or pulled something, and given time, all would be right again when his body had worked through whatever this disruption to his unique brand of normalcy was. But when he allowed that sweet cane syrup to wash over the insides of his mouth like a delicious coat of paint, he saw stars brighter than he had ever before, even though he was huddled on the floor of the coal shaft yards from the outdoors, where the real stars could be viewed through the leafy treetops. Pain greater than any he had ever known exploded inside his head, and greater than when he had disjointed and subsequently broken his toe before having to reset it with his own ill-prepared hands. Far greater the pain he had felt when he had stumbled and fallen ass over tea kettle into this place that he now called home and he pressed his hand to his throbbing jaw, and then harder, hoping that the pressure would alleviate some of the torture, but it did nothing except make the outside of his jaw hurt, and also cramp the ends of his fingers. The pain made it so that he couldn't think, but he tried to as he slowly weaved back and forth while still keeping his hand pressed firmly against his cheek. He tried to think of anyone he had ever known that had complained about having a similar ailment and if so, what had been done to release them from the agony? No one came to mind. Everyone he had ever known had been as healthy as a horse until they had been found dead after dying in their sleep. Clean living and hard work and a clear conscience keeps a man healthy, his father had always said. He paced around his fire as he noted how little use that particular pearl of wisdom that his father had dropped had been. Moaning offered no ease either, but he began to do it anyway, and it seemed the thing to do at a time like that. 
He wondered if something cool might ease the pain in a way a cool damp cloth will help with the headache or a sprain. He was frightened of trying it, but if it helped, then he'd be glad he gave it a go. He fumbled around until he clasped his fingers around a canteen, and with a shaking hand he lifted it to his lips and filled his mouth with cool water. His jaw pained him too greatly to spew the water from his mouth with the force he wanted to use, Instead, simply parted his lips and allowed the water to fall from his mouth to the dirt floor as he moaned even louder. The pain that had been horrible had somehow been worsened by the water, but Reuben didn't think it was the water that had instigated the increase in the agony. Thinking about how it had felt when the cool water washed over the insides of his mouth led him to believe that he knew what he needed. The water, yes but at a very different temperature. He poured water from his canteen into one of his two wooden bowls and balanced it on the rocks that made up the fire ring. It was a tricky trying to get the vessel near enough to the fire so that the water would heat without catching the wood bowl on fire. Having to heat the water in this way was going to be excruciatingly slow, and his staring at it did not speed up the process. He now knew exactly what the old saying meant by a watched pot never boils. The water wasn't as hot as he would have liked, but it was quite warm, and what remained in the wooden bowl would continue to heat up the longer it sat near the fire. He soaked a section of shirt sleeve in the water and then folded it a little before pressing the warmth against his cheek. The relief he felt was not a total and complete one, but the severity of the pain was definitely lessened. For the first time in hours, it seemed, his body relaxed and he began to breathe more normally. And for the remainder of the night, and all the next day and night, Reuben slowly paced the interior of the coal shaft with the warm, moist cloth pressed against his cheek. He ventured from his home only when he needed to fill his canteen with water. An opossum and a squirrel were caught in his snares, he gave them a look and passed them by without taking any action. He supposed that they would become supper for a different predator, and he didn't care. He didn't even have the energy to free them and throw their carcasses somewhere away from the pool. Likely, his harnesses would be molested and destroyed, but just then, he didn't care about that either. It was the second morning since the pain had begun that Reuben realized that he had a decision to make and it was not an easy one. He now knew, after tender but extensive investigation with the tips of his fingers and tongue, that he had a tooth that had gone bad. He could not live until it suddenly decided to heal itself because in all likelihood it would never happen. He didn't know much about the body, but he did think that he knew that if a body part went bad, it almost never went back right again and the doctors that served when he had still been a part of the war knew this also. That was why so many men drew the detail of pushing wheelbarrow loads of arms and legs away during and after each battle to be buried or burned. The body is a wondrous and splendid thing, but it has its limitations, and there are some things it can't come back from. Reuben was now convinced that his rotten tooth was one of these things. The decision before him was to go to one of the farmsteads and beg for help, or take care of the problem himself. If he went and asked for assistance, he would probably get it despite his unsightly and disheveled appearance, and because from what he had observed, the residents around here, being mostly keep-to-themselves types, would likely help him and then forget him. But someone somewhere along the way would take notice of him and have questions. Once it was known there was a stranger in their midst, folks wouldn't stop looking until they found him and understood who he was and why he was there. He might get his tooth fixed, but in doing, he would open himself up to greater problems. Or he could fix the problem himself, just as he had done with his toe. Remember how enjoyable that had been, he thought. His knife had sat in the hot water for a time and was as sterile and clean as it was ever going to be, yet he just let it sit there while he stared at it. 
He was trying to work up the courage to do what he must do. And courage was something that most would have doubted he had an ounce of. An argument could be made that it had taken tremendous courage to come to this place and live as he had lived, but others would have said that if he had owned any courage at all, he wouldn't have run away from his friends and duty in the first place. He could debate all this with himself again at a later time, but now he had to find enough courage just to pick up the knife. His hand was trembling as if palsy as he reached for it, and some of the tremors were from the constant and unrelenting pain, and the rest was from his fear of doing what he believed he had to do. Perhaps he would not feel so terrified if he had any faith at all that what he was about to do was in fact the right thing, or that he had any idea of how to do what he was going to attempt. Confidence in either was hidden from him, his fingers closed around the handle of the knife and he closed his eyes as if not being able to see would somehow make all of it easier. He cautiously touched the steel blade to his lips and unfortunately found that the heat of the blade was not so great that he could not stand it. He could have benefited from another minute to prepare himself. Before he could find a reason to postpone, he opened his mouth as wide as the pain would allow him to and inserted the knife blade. He knew with his tongue and finger the tooth that was causing such a bother, but all seemed confusing and puzzling when trying to do it feeling about with a knife blade tip. In turn, he tapped at the top of each tooth until he located the one that he was after. There was no doubt about it once he had. A tremendous and terrible charge rattled his body when the steel landed on the diseased tooth. He still jerked and flinched the next time he did it, but at least he had prepared himself for its coming. Before he could talk himself out of it, he traced the surface of the tooth with the tip of the knife until he felt the sharp prick of the knife leaving the bone and finding the tender flesh of the gum that surrounded it. Drool flowed from his lip and onto his lap from keeping his mouth open, and he made soft sounds of fear. He took a deep breath and pushed the tip of the knife between his tooth and the gum. It wasn't that there was no pain. His screams echoing off the walls testified to the fact that there was, but he pushed harder. Even while plunging the knife in deeper and deeper, he wagged it around as much as he felt like he could until he felt a gap, or what he perceived was being a gap. Feeling more than knowing the direction he should push, he worked the tip of the knife under the tooth where it met his jawbone, and once he was relatively sure he had pressed the knife inwards as far as the blade's width would allow him to, he began to twist and pull downward on the knife's handle. Crying freely and making sounds that he had been unaware of that a man could make, he wrapped his free hand around the one holding the knife and pulled down with all his strength. His reward was a sudden pop, followed by the tip of the knife puncturing the roof of his mouth. Reuben allowed the knife to fall to the dirt floor and then laced his fingers together to try to quiet the shaking. He sat with his head bowed and his mouth open, and the blood poured free, and soon the tooth that had caused so much trouble tumbled out atop the crimson stream. His face was drenched in tears and sweat as he stared at the ivory and black piece of himself lying in the red sand. He started to stand, but realized that even if he did make it upright, he would not have the power to walk. And crawling, he made his way to a small bed. He pulled one of his shirts to him. The fabric was so brittle and worn that it wasn't a problem tearing swatches from it. With shaking hands, he folded and folded the small piece and gingerly inserted it into his mouth. He used his tongue to help place it into the hole that felt cavernous and then bit down hard and he hoped that soon this would staunch the flow of blood. And he dragged himself onto his bed and laid on his side, and he was afraid to lie on his back for fear of swallowing his own blood if the bleeding didn't stop relatively soon. 
Reuben slept more from exhaustion than from relief. 9. He walked softly up to a point and then stopped altogether. It was unclear to him if he was doing the correct thing. He knew this place and why it was special, and because of that knowledge, he felt like a trespasser or an interloper. But he also felt that words needed to be said, and he believed himself the only person, or at least the person most uniquely qualified to say those words. What those words were, he didn't know, but he felt certain that they would come to him when they were needed. He just needed to start. A pair of ducks were gliding across a small pond. Every little bit, one or the other, would bob its head under the water to look around and then furiously shake the water from its head after re-emerging. She was facing in the direction of the ducks, but he didn't believe that she was watching them. He believed her thoughts to be where they normally were when she came to this place, a thousand miles away, but also right beside where she now sat. He knew what she was thinking about. She had discussed it one time or another, and he had been told of it. Would you mind terribly if I sat down beside you and passed some time in your company, he asked her. He already started crouching before she answered by shaking her head slowly back and forth. Her answering had merely been a detail. He had planned all along on sitting down. She placed a hand on the small of his back to help him down. Getting down to the ground wasn't as easily done for him now as it had once been. She was kind enough to make no remark when both knees cracked and popped loudly, and for long moments they sat in silence and watched the ducks. I'm not as smart as I like to think myself to be, so anything I might think to say, you probably already know. But on occasion, hearing things said aloud by someone else can be helpful, and that's all I'm trying to be by coming here and horning in on your quiet time, he said. It's fine, Mr. Miller, Starry said. I've always enjoyed talking to you. First off, I've told you about that Mr. Nonsense, and I'd like for you to call me Eb just like everyone else does. After all, You were to have been my daughter-in-law, which to me would have meant the same as you being my daughter. Were you going to call me Mr. Miller for the rest of your life? Ebenezer asked. He had been concerned about finding the right words to say, and just out of the gate he had said something that had made her cry. She was trying to smile at the same time, but she wasn't doing a very good job of it. Now, I know there's a peacefulness and a familiarity to this place that you hope and might even think brings comfort to you, but you need to stay away from here. Ghosts afford us no peace, and they do not quiet our minds or heal our hearts, and ghosts are all that come to this place now, he said. Do you think I come here to talk with a ghost or feel one sitting beside me, she asked. Ghost of memory... I think for you they are one and the same. I have a knowledge of such things. Do you not think that I went and sat on the edge of his bed for more nights than I can count, just so I could try and feel what you were trying to feel? I was with him every day for almost twenty years. I was with him even when he went away. He was my son, so how can I not be with him in one way or another, no matter where he was fighting, he said. So you just decided to no longer be with him? She asked. It was meant as a sincere question, but it had come out rather cool and edgy. I decided nothing. I simply came to a realization. When the letter came that told me of how many that had fallen on or around that worthless bridge, and that despite their best efforts, my son had not been found, I began to think and feel differently. No one knew where his body had lain down for its final rest, so I knew that I could never be with him again, but I also knew that he would always be with me, he said. Do you not think it possible that he was wounded and was taken somewhere to be cared for? Perhaps he is sitting in the sun even now, but has no notion of who he is because his injuries were not to his body alone, but also to his mind. 
Perhaps he cannot tell them who to send for because he does not know, she said. Well, yes, I considered that. I believe that I have thought of all things possible. And if I were told today that aside from having no recall of his prior life to the war, my son Reuben was healthy and well, and I would rejoice as no other ever could. Even if I was told that I could never cast my eyes upon him again, I would rejoice because he was alive. But I don't feel that is a possibility. It has been nine years since that letter came to my door, and I'm sure that he is now where there is no war and never will be, Eb told her. Reuben asked me to be his wife. Ask only that I love him for the rest of my life as he promised that he would love me. And I gave him my word and my solemn vow that I would do that gladly. Nine years and nine times that amount of years, I cannot break my promise to him, Starr replied with conviction. I never suggested that you stop loving him, nor would I ever suggest such a thing. If I had ten lifetimes and all the world to search, I could never have found anyone that I would have preferred more than you for my son. With all my heart, I wanted for the both of you what I want for you now, and that is to be happy and live in a life that you can look back on one day with satisfaction. That cannot ever be with Reuben, but it still can be yours to have. Coming here and pining for that which you can never have again will not serve you except to take from you that which you have so much of to give. Now your heart is tender, but it is also large. Reuben will always be there, but it is big enough for more than his memory. A thousand times and more I have wished that you could have become my daughter as was intended, but now I want you to have someone to sit by near a fire at night. And I want to see the children that you will raise to be fine men and women. I want you to know happiness again, Eb said. I don't think I'll ever be able to feel toward another the way I felt about Reuben, Starry said. I know that you won't, Eb told her. There are no others exactly like Reuben, and there aren't supposed to be. But if you give someone a chance to make you happy, you might find that you appreciate them as much, but in a different way. As wise as you may think yourself to be, you are not the first to tell me such things over these nine years. However, because it is you and because of who you were to Reuben and are to me, your words carry more weight and fall deeper into my thinking. I never wanted Reuben or his spirit to think that I turned my back on the promise that I made to him, but I never wanted you to think I had abandoned him in any way either. And my commitment to him was forever, and even though he has been so long parted from us, I would not have you think that I considered my promise a frivolous gesture. Despite the loneliness, I could not have you thinking ill of me. That would break again an already broken heart. Starry said to him. Well, I could no more think harshly of you than I could think harshly of him. You will forever be my daughter I wished for. I do not expect to leave this place and find that the sun has finally begun to rise in your heart, but I hope that you will give it a chance to if there is an opportunity. Now come to this place now and then and remember my son and all he meant to you, but do not become a ghost to yourself in the doing. Bring the daughter I want you to have to this place one day and tell her about my son and how he was your first love. Tell her how she will always remember her first love. I know that I said earlier not to come to this place, but that was wrong. Come, but come for the right reasons. Do not come and roll the spirit. Come to treasure the memory and then leave and live. You are now only existing do you think that even for a moment my son would have wanted you to be unhappy, he asked. Starry shook her head back and forth as she dabbed at her eyes with a handkerchief that Eb had handed her. He put his arm around her shoulder and felt her lean into him, and she wept softly with her head on his shoulder. He held her tight, but not too tightly. As much as I wish he could see you, I know that he wishes the same thing even more wherever he is now. What you have been left with is not what you want, and you cannot touch it. 
but you can go live and remember how treasured you were. Very few are granted a love like you had. Now be glad in the fact that you will always know what it felt like, Eb whispered. She encircled him with her arms once they had stood up, and he let her hold on to him as long as she needed to. Now you dry those tears and take my hand. My wife was making a fine supper when I left, and you'll be coming along to help eat it. Make no offers of excuse or refuse, because I will not accept either. We will go and eat, and then we will share fond memories of Reuben, he said. 10. He looked around the interior of the coal shaft after he had dropped the latest limb into the wooden box. His face was expressionless. There was no sign of pride or accomplishment, neither was there sign of revulsion or disgust. His face remained a blank canvas. It was the face of a man who had been forced to accept nothing and accept what was. This is what became of my life, he thought. One hundred and forty limbs in the box. Twelve years in this place with nothing to show for it other than a ragged bed and a pile of sticks that only loosely resemble a chair. On one of his explorings, he had found the wooden box washed down a creek and wedged into a bank. There were probably a few different things that he could have used it for, but after it dried out, and he thought that holding the record of his time here might be the best use of all for it. Lasting might be the only thing of importance he will ever do. When his meat was done, he pulled the skewer from above the fire and ate the meat straight from the stick. There had been times in the past when he had made almost a production out of mealtime, in so much as he could, the way his mother had while he was growing up. He would have a vegetable or two and the meat, of course. He would have his bowl and his fork neatly arranged and waiting for when the food was finished cooking. And then he would force himself to eat slowly as he remembered pleasant evenings around the table with his parents, or sometimes he would imagine that he was having a meal that Starry had prepared for them. She would talk of some fanciful notion that had crossed her mind, and he would smile as he listened and ate, not pretending to smile for her benefit, but actually smiled because he enjoyed listening to her so very much. Sometimes when the things would drift away like the smoke from the coal fire, he would realize that he was still smiling and he would force himself to stop because none of it was real and it never would be. But those had been meals from times past. Now he rarely used the bowl or fork, and even more seldom did he find reason to smile. It had been more than a year since he had plucked any growing thing from the ground or from the vine to eat. Meat was still plentiful, and it would suffice. Growing the poor excuse for a garden brought in a few fresh things to ingest, but it was also a sham, a depressing one at that. Growing a garden was the same as planting flowers or painting a house. They helped to sustain you, yes, but those were tasks that you did to beautify your life. To try to do any of those things in this place could be construed as him being fond of this place, that he took pride in it, that he was content here, but none of those could be further from the truth. The only reason he stayed was because he was afraid of what he might find if he ventured too far away. For all he knew, the country had not yet run out of men to sacrifice and the war was still raging. If the war was still going on, or even if it wasn't, someone might still be looking for him just to show that they never shirked the task once it had been given to them. The ones that did that type of work never gave up. He could leave, but if he was found out, he was no longer able to run as far and as fast as he once could, he would be caught. And even if he did manage to wriggle away a second time, there was little hope of finding a place that met most of his needs as this place had. And then, out in the open and after an arduous delay, he would be caught. Stang did not rule out that he would be discovered, but it greatly reduced the chances of such a thing happening. He bit into the meat and ate without tasting it. He did not smile at the fact that he had pulled it from the fire just as the meat was done, but before it burned. He simply stared at the fire and chewed until there was no meat left to eat, and then threw the bones into the fire. 
Reuben Miller was a smart and insightful man, so he was well aware of what he was allowing himself to become. He was reverting back to that which teachers theorized mankind had fought and clawed its way away from in order to become a higher form of human. He was becoming animalistic in his mood and in his habits, and he knew that he was. It wasn't that he was powerless to stop the regression. It was that he simply did not care anymore. Life itself, but more importantly, life was story, had made him want to be a better man. Every day he had wanted to be better and more, especially for her, than he had been the day before and the day before that. But now his life was an unending circle of catching something to eat and then doing it again. And that's all there was now. Aside from the fact that he knew how to make and maintain the fire, he was no different from an animal. And he no longer cared. He lived in a burrow. He was filthy. He tore meat from the bones with long, dirty claws. And he grunted and chuffed more than he spoke sensible words. He knew all these things, but the strength to change no longer resided within him. Working to make this place where he huddled from public eye and his life in general take on a semblance of a normal life did not have the same effect on him as it did for other people. That was why he stopped trying and stopped caring. It was just too hard, not the doing, but the seeing afterwards. Constructing a routine and being pleased when each item was ticked on the list each day was what other people did. He didn't do such any longer. It was all part of that having conversations with yourself trap. Living each day as if you were one of those people, the ones that lived in real houses and had real interactions with other real people, was all make-believe that whisked you to pleasant heights so quickly that you never realized it had happened and then forced you to open your eyes so you could see the ground coming to meet you as you fell. You can't survive by living in an imaginary world, no matter how pleasant it is while you are there. But you can't stand trying to make something out of what you have either, because you have to see it for what it is, and that makes things just as bad if not worse. So you put blinders on and focus only on what is directly in front of you and take very small steps so that you don't take in too much at a time. And you hide from the world in this dark place but you learn to hide from yourself as well, else you will not last. Animals make noise when walking through dry leaves. Not much and not near so much as a man, but they do make noise. He perked his ears and forced himself to step out from the dark place where his mind had taken him, and he listened intently. In a world as quiet as Reuben's world was, any small sound gathered his attention rather quickly. And after having spent so many years developing his paranoia, it would have been hard for him not to jump at every shadow. There was a soft growling combined with a plaintive keening. Reuben breathed a sigh of relief. He didn't yet know what it was outside and somewhere just above him, but he did know that it wasn't a man. He bent over at the waist and walked up the ramp that led out of the coal shaft and then stopped at the entrance so he could listen again. He couldn't see out, but he could hear. Between the setting sun and the door, he had woven together from simple limbs and laurel sprouts, visibility was impossible. It was just one more thing to try and keep his home from being discovered, and he thought it did fine work of concealing the shaft, but neither could he see out of it from the inside, so he stood very still and listened. Whatever it was was no more than a few feet away. He tried to understand what he was hearing, but he couldn't. With his knife in hand, he nudged the door open gradually and stuck his head out of the shaft. If he saw what was making the noise, then his curiosity would have been sated and he could go back to sitting in front of the fire till it was time to go and check his snares the next afternoon. If he didn't see what was causing the sounds, even better. He was in no mood to be disturbed. He had enough self-loathing and situational hatred to attend to without all of these interruptions. The light was failing, but his eyes were still sharp. Still, he could see nothing out of the way as far as he could tell. 
but then there was movement a few yards away from the entrance to the shaft. A hissing, an almost groaning. He thought that he could identify almost anything that neighbored with him in these trees by the sounds that they make, whether at calm or in distress, but he did not recognize the sound that he had just heard. With caution, he eased himself through the hole that served as his entrance and stood on the slope ground of the ridge. Only then could he see and identify what had roused him. The bobcat tried to stand, and it did, but it stood on wobbling legs as it stared at him. It tried to hiss ferociously, as they are fond of doing, but it seemed to take something from the animal, and it fell back to the ground and began that mournful keening again. Only slightly more relaxed, Reuben walked over so that he could see better. His first thought had been rabies. As a young man, he had seen a cat with rabies, and it had made an unusual sound as well as display problems with walking and merely standing. Rabbit animals were nothing to be trifled with, but as he approached it, he saw none of the signs associated with the disease. Still, it was hurt or in pain, or it would not be acting so pitifully. The animal could not move so well. That was obvious by the way that it kept turning its head, so an eye could be kept on Reuben. But Reuben was slinky, and the cat was almost immobile. Reuben bent over and grabbed quickly and exactly at the fur on the back of the bobcat's neck. And once he had a firm hole there, it didn't leave the animal with many options. Less because of its inability to move as it normally would have. It was a big cat, and despite its woeful health, it still proved to be a handful. But Reuben was patient and allowed the cat to play itself out. And when it was once again still, Reuben laid the bobcat on its side with a knee pressed against its head and his left hand holding down the hindquarters. The front leg he didn't worry about striking out and slashing at him. He could see that the injury was to that portion of the cat's body and the leg could barely move. There was a deep laceration down the front of the leg that originated at the animal's shoulder. It was seeping thick green and yellow fluid around that which had already congealed. Dirt and fur were muted into the wound. Whether the wound had come from a musket ball grazing the leg or if the wound had been incurred in a fight, Reuben didn't know, but he did know that the animal would not live in its present condition. Its inability to move would cause the animal to starve to death unless the infection killed it first. So with care, perhaps the leg could be restored, but that meant that the one giving the care would in some way have to care if the animal lived or died, and Reuben didn't. He had eaten a bobcat once since arriving at this place, and it had not agreed with him. So when Reuben drew his knife across the bobcat's throat and spilled its life blood, and then threw it down the ridge, it wasn't because he was scared of eating the meat that could have traces of infection. It was because he did not like the way the bobcat tasted. If he couldn't eat the animal, then he had no use for it, and he sure wasn't going to listen to it holler until it finally decided to die. He wiped the blood from the blade with the leaves and went back through the door into the coal shaft. The fire was dwindling, so he added more coal. Thank you for listening to this episode of Stagecoach, brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, the home of Western excellence where the best of the Western authors can be found. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue with Honored Friend and Hero by Jeff Crawford. <laughs>